ladies and gentlemen, we are back with the Five Star Podcast, and I'm here with uh, with uh, with speaker and former professional wrestler Jeff Bearden. How's it going, Jeff? Good, good. Very nice to to be in Kentucky, and it's been a it's been a good experience being here for a couple of days. I haven't got to see much, but I've seen some beautiful you know mountains and a lot greener oh, yeah. than what it is in Las Vegas. Oh yeah, a lot. <laughs> Never been to Las Vegas, but I imagine it's a lot a lot more flat. Yeah, the deserts. <laughs> yeah, deserts something different than what Kentucky is with all its greenery. Cool. Uh, this we had to we had to zoom out the camera a little bit. I've never had someone this tall on the show. I don't <laughs> think we had uh, we had Jake Roberts on there, and he was a little bit taller than me, but we were sitting down at the time. So right. So that's a little you know it's a it's a little different story. So so what brings you to Kentucky? Um, yesterday I did the commencement speech for the graduation at the David School, and it it was a great experience. Great kids. Uh, they, you know, they had like 150 people turn out for the graduation. I mean, there was only eight kids graduating, so. Hmm. But I learned a lot about that, uh, about that school, and I mean, it's really an amazing thing. I don't know how much you know about it and stuff, but I mean, it's a school that, I guess technically it's a private school, but it doesn't charge the kids anything, so there's no tuition. Um, everything is done off of donations and grants and volunteers and people's kindness. You know, most of the teachers there are volunteer teachers. So, <laughs> yeah, I kind of I went to a college at Alice Lloyd College, and it's right down the road here. And it's a, uh, it, it's basically that way with a college. They don't charge tuition. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, they don't charge tuition, but it, you also have to, you, you have to do a work study. So you kind of you kind of work for your tuition. You work for your tuition, which uh, I had no problem with. Right. Uh, once you uh, get through a college and you don't have any, <laughs> don't have any debt, you'll you'll. You'll be thankful. You'll for be thankful for you. Yeah. The 20, 40 <laughs> hours you put in while going to college. But, uh, you know, good stuff. Uh, those communities like, and I know with Alice Lloyd, it, it was just a really, it was a community. It wasn't as much, a, it didn't feel like you were going to school as you were just, you know, you were just part of a family. I'm right. sure that's That's, that's pretty much what they said there, is, you know, is that everybody's a family. You know, there's no, uh, there's no teacher's lounge. There's, you know, the students and the teachers all eat together in like a communal lunch. You know, they all clean up and, you know, everything is pretty well self-sufficient around that place. They've got a garden and uh, they make their own hot sauce there. It's really good. And, you know, the kids and stuff are very appreciative of, of what the teachers are able to do for them. You know, and unfortunately, because it's such a it's pretty well a volunteer situation on the teachers and stuff. Sometimes and stuff, there's a turnover, you know, which I think is stuff for the kids and stuff is a little tough because they get attached to a teacher and then they're gone. But there's some that have been around for a long time there. So what kind of things did you talk about in your commencement speech? Um, you know, I was just trying to express to these kids that are graduating that there's a whole big world out there. You know, they're going through their first, you know, really their first big hurdle in life is graduating high school. You know, so now they've completed that, and you know it's where they want to go. You know, following graduation, and uh, you know I, I spoke to them about you know having dreams and then trying to make those dreams become a reality rather than staying as a dream. You know, they got to make those dreams into a goal and then work toward that goal to be able to succeed whatever it is that they want to do. And uh, and you uh, your goal you started out. I guess you started out as a, as an athlete playing mm -hmm. ba playing basketball. Yeah, I was a basketball. I was uh, an all state basketball player in high school. I was an all two time all conference player in college. Went to Belgium to play professional basketball over there. Um, you know, I was supposed to get drafted by the Atlanta Hawks, and that all fell through when Ted Turner was doing the Goodwill Games and he picked two Russians to draft rather than two Americans. So I kind of lost that on that deal with the Hawks and stuff. So I went to Europe to play and kind of got burned out. So I had contract problems. So I came home and, um, you know, I grew up in Amarillo, Texas around Dory and Terry Funk all the time and Dick Murdoch. So they had told me that they would teach me how to wrestle as long as I went to college and got my degree. So it, w it was funny when I came back, I contacted Terry Funk. And so Terry said, well, let me get in touch with Dory and stuff about doing your training. And at that time, I was living in Abilene, Texas, and Dory was in Charlotte, North Carolina. But what I didn't know is that when Terry called Dory, Dory actually called my father <laughs> to find out where <laughs> I went to college and that I got a degree. And as soon as he found that out, he got back in touch with me and said, let's come out and get the training started. 
And and I guess he he did that just because wrestling is a you have to have something to fall back. He on. wanted me to have something to fall back on, you know. And I mean I you know fortunately I had a a 25 year career that kept me pretty busy most of the time. And it's you know I guess I did something right. I ended up in um, being inducted into the Southern Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame last year. All right. So it was it was a great accolade to end my career pretty well on and stuff on on a note like that. Yep. Yeah, uh, Dory, Terry Funk, and uh, and you got you started in Texas, but it, but you went all over the world basically. Oh, I've been in almost thirty different countries. Thirty different countries. W one thing that stood out to me, I was, uh, you had a, I didn't I didn't even know there was a big wrestling population in South Africa. Right. But uh, <laughs> but evidently that it, it it was intense over there, and you were in one feud that ended up you got stabbed by a fan. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, that was a, you know, Durban, South Africa was a crazy place. It's uh, probably 90% Indian community. You know, I think it's the largest Indian community outside of, outside of India. So I had, a, I had a feud going with an Indian wrestler, and it got very intense sometimes and stuff. I mean, I wrestled in Durban 15 times. I had 11 police escorts out. I was actually stabbed twice on two different occasions. In Durban, I got I got lucky on the first one that when they stabbed, I got stabbed in the chest, and the doctors only said that the blade had been going, thankfully went up and down. So when it hit my rib, it bounced up, because he said if it had been turned sideways, it'd gone between the ribs and got my heart, and there was nothing we could have done about that. Hmm. Yeah, that uh, that kind of kind of reminds me of the uh, the wrestling uh, the wrestling fans that used to be. Here in Eastern Kentucky, back mm -hmm. back in the uh, back in the uh, early '90s and stuff, we, we had uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Smoky with, Mountain with with Jim Cornette, and I remember those guys would be chased to their cars. Oh yeah, a every, every it seemed every every week they were running a show around here, and they just it was just a whole other it was a whole other whole other level of heat, you know that that, right. pe that people don't people don't really see nowadays anymore. Uh, so what uh. You wrestled for 25 years, right? And what was what was always your goal? Was it was it just to, just to provide for yourself for wrestling? You know, I was. I, I just really enjoyed what I did. You know, I, I enjoyed the entertainment part of it. I I enjoyed the performing. You know, I, I just like being out there in front of the fans every night. You know, I think that was one reason why for me, doing the international circuit that I did was was such a good thing because they don't get a chance to see seven foot people. I mean, I'm one of only 2,800 people in the world that are seven foot or taller out of seven, what is it, 7.3 billion? And there's 2,800 of us. It's tough. I, I, don't, I don't know that I've ever <laughs> talked to anyone this tall. So <laughs> the, uh, and a lot of, I've, it seems a lot of your speaking career is a lot, of, is a lot about, uh, about overcoming and, uh, you know, hitting the bottom and, and then coming up. Right. Have, have you... Did you have your moment where? Oh you sure, okay. I, I've been there throughout my career. So I'm in the early parts of my career. You know, with the wrestling business and stuff, there's a there's a lot of partying that goes on and stuff after the matches. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was not uncommon for somebody to grab a case of beer and we're going to drink a case of beer on the way home. Um, for me and stuff, I developed a little bit of an alcohol problem in my 20s, and I came out on the other end of that. And while I was living in South Africa, I got involved with, I had a little bit of a drug issue for a couple of years and came out the other side of that. So I do talk to a lot of people about overcoming addiction. Um, you know, one of the new things I'm starting to talk on and stuff that I'm seeing a lot of problems throughout the, really throughout the country, but throughout the world is dealing with depression and anxiety. You know, there's a lot of people, a lot more people have that than what people realize. I think there's, 200 million people and stuff that suffer from depression. Mm -hmm. So that's really where I'm starting to go besides my youth stuff. You know, I do a lot of talks at schools for the anti-bullying campaigns that are going on because that's such an epidemic in the schools. But I also try to make kids realize and stuff what their potential is and how to be true to themselves and realize what their uniqueness is and then try to expand on that to create a career. The uh, you mentioned depression is uh, is that something that's really common in the wrestling industry towards the end of because I, I hear uh, I, you see these uh, these stories and uh, about about you know these wrestlers that uh, 
a lot of them don't come out the other end of this. Right. Thing. You know, a lot of them d don't have that opportunity. But I remember seeing a uh, an interview with uh, with with Scott Hall. Uh, right. And he said, you know, what's what's left to live for when they stop chanting your name? Because and really the uh, when you're when you're in a really not just wrestling but sports or or anything, the shelf life of an athlete is typically not not well, that, sure. not that long. But for someone that gets to the top and they get, they have all the money and they ha have everything, they don't really have a long time before that starts coming to an end. D do you see that? Well, you know, fortunately, it's just like one thing that makes wrestling such a tough thing for for us where we run into a lot of problems with the addictions and depression and everything else is that we go year round. We go 365 days a year. And self-medicate. You, know, you know, professional football and basketball and baseball, they've all got a season and stuff, and when it's over, it's over. And, you know, guys get a chance to heal and mm -hmm. kind of get their senses back and just kind of relax and get away from everything and come back pretty fresh for spring training or whenever it is. Wrestling and stuff, if you're not working, you're not making money. So, I mean, we've got to stay working. And that's where you start seeing all the self-medicating of, of the – you know, uppers to get up in the morning to get to the shows, you know, and then you get to the shows and it's the pain pills and the the muscle relaxers to get through that match. And then after that, the partying starts. So you start seeing the uppers, the downers, the muscle relaxers, pain pills, alcohol, cocaine, all of that stuff starts coming in after the shows. You know, and then they're, you know, then guys tend to take, uh, you know, sleeping pills to be able to go to sleep at night. And then it just starts over the next day, which makes it really tough. Makes it really, uh, you know, that's uh, it's something, especially here in Eastern Kentucky. We see a lot of, we see a lot of, we see a lot of, a lot of drug abuse. I've heard, I've heard that. Yeah, we see it. You know, it's a uh, constant. Uh, it's it's always on the, we it's always in the news. It, we've we're always looking for ways to to battle it. Uh, did did you battle that yourself, or was it just alcohol or? Uh, no, I had, I did cocaine for a couple of years. So I mean, I, I had a big coke problem at one time so when, I, when I was living in South Africa. How did how did you how did you overcome that? Um, you know, I'm one of the fortunate ones. I was able to pretty well stop cold turkey. I realized, you know, I got caught in a situation and realized that this isn't what I need to be doing anymore, and started taking the steps that I needed to take to get away from it. And one, you know, what people don't realize is that if you really want to get away, if you've got a, a drug or an alcohol problem. You've got to change your crowd first and foremost of who you're running around with, because those are usually the people that you're doing the drug and alcohol with. So they're going to keep encouraging you, which makes it harder to, for you to stop. For me, as if I had to completely change, I quit going to nightclubs. I quit running around with all the guys that I ran around with in South Africa that I was doing the cocaine with. And so that was what helped me. But I mean, I know a lot of guys. I mean. You know, you mentioned Scott Hall. So Scott's been in and out of rehab numerous times, and he's just had a really hard time, you know, shaking that monkey on his back. And some of us, like me, were fortunate enough to come out, you know, on the other end without having to go through all the rehab stuff that, you know, some of the guys do, and some people never come out of it. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's really tough, and it's a, it's a hard thing to sit and watch people you know go through that. I mean, I knew Scott from Puerto Rico in 1990. I mean, I haven't probably talked to Scott since probably 94, and then he got into all the, you know, then everything started happening for him. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's a tough life instead of being a wrestler. People don't realize that. It's like, oh, it's all fake. Yeah. But, you know, if I pick you up and slam you, gravity says you have to land. Yeah, so and for every action, there's an equal and opposite exactly. reaction. Exactly. So when you hit that mat, you know it you, takes the a reaction, toll on your body. The reaction is what it does to your joints and your and your bones. And your yeah, it, it jars you. I mean, there's no way that you, even though there's there's some give in a ring and stuff. It, you know, everybody's got this misconception as a trampoline. There's not that much spring in it. You know, there's a little bit of give where the the whole ring itself gives, but for the most part, it's just steel plywood. A little bit of foam and a mat. Yeah. You know, so it's not really comfortable to land on. Then you got guys that are dropping you six, seven, eight feet up in the air and stuff, and you've got to land. Yeah, and the thing about it nowadays is that, is that well, everything progresses. And now, now, you know, I, I see WWE trying to do things like, uh, like, you know, 
get ahead of concussions and stuff and stop, right. and stop that. But uh, but the way things progresses progresses and to keep entertaining people, it seems like they have to get more and more dangerous as it, as it goes along. There's a lot of fans that want to see it go back to the more dangerous and yep. you know all the blood and everything else that you know like when I was doing it stuff there was a lot of blood and everything. I mean I used to feud with Abdullah the Butcher and. Okay. Puerto Rico, and I mean, there was not a match that we had and stuff that it wasn't some kind of a bloodbath. Yeah, uh, Jim Cornette, I read a good quote from him the other day about about that type of stuff, and he said, back when I was, back when he was wrestling, or well, back when he was managing, he said that uh, they really didn't hurt each other, and everybody thought it was real. Right. And now, it's getting to the point where, well, it's better now, but it was getting to the point where People thought it was fake, and they were really right. hurting each other. They're twice. hurting each other worse, worse now than, than they, they were, were 30 yeah. years ago. And I mean, peop more people are screaming it's fake now than what they did in the 80s. Yeah, you know, <laughs> which is sad. I mean, it's, but I mean, it's it, wrestling evolves. It, I mean, it's it's kind of a roller coaster. You know, it, it has its up times and it has its down times. You know, so it's just a matter of which cycle you manage to to get involved with. You know, when I first started, my first year of wrestling was when they did the first WrestleMania. So, I mean, seeing Vince take over everything and stuff through the cable networks really changed everything. To where if you really weren't working for them, you weren't making money. So, so you got in after the, after all the territories had pretty much... The territories were dying. Di they were dying. They were, they were still there, but they were dying. But, you know, a lot of the, you know, even with my size and stuff, it was hard because... Well, back then, it's, I was seven foot and maybe 285, so, I mean, I was still pretty thin. You know, I'm like 370 now. So, I mean, it was a big difference if I'd been 370 then. It would, you know, people would have taken more of a chance on me, but because I was just coming into wrestling, you know, all these old territories and stuff were, they're starting to fail and, and you know, close the doors and everything else. So, they wanted guys with experience. And, you know, I, I hadn't had it yet. You know, I'd only had a few matches, and I'm, you know, trying to call all over the country, trying to get booked into a territory, and, you know, most of them were either closing or not taking a chance on a new guy. Yep. So I got started doing international shows, and that was kind of my niche. And so if I ended up doing international shows most of my career, I didn't work in the States very much. So, so uh, and international shows, a lot of guys here, you know, they get uh, – they they aspire to get to a shop, get to a place where they've got a contract and it's right. a consistent amount of money. Is it kind of like that internationally, or was it you pay, you you pay when you get re you're paid when you wrestle. You paid when you wrestle. You know nobody would put you under contract on an international show. You know now they would agree to bring you out so often and they would pay. Pr I mean Japan was a great pla paying place. You know and everybody wanted to go to Japan because the money was so good. But you were getting an influx of American guys coming in. So they weren't bringing guys over as regular as they used to. You know, some of the mainstays for, for all Japan, like Stan Hansen and Dr. Death, Steve Williams and Terry Gordy and all those guys, you know, they were going over there 12, 15, 16, 20 weeks a year. You know, so they stayed pretty steady, but they were bringing in a lot of people and stuff to filter in under them, and they wanted different people all the time. So it was really tough to get into Japan and, and make a spot for yourself so you knew you were staying busy. So I worked, um, worked Japan a little bit. I worked a lot in Mexico. Uh, I was in Puerto Rico for a couple of years, worked Europe, spent a lot of time in South Africa. Um, you know, they originally, uh, which is, I'm kind of glad that I did because I got to see a country go through everything that it's gone through. You know, when I went there for the first time in 91, it was still apartheid. Oh, okay. So, I mean, seeing that was a completely thing that you haven't seen in the States. And, you know, I was going out for like two, three, four weeks at a time, three or four times a year. So I went out there for three years doing that, and I watched kind of the changes of when it was when apartheid stopped. And then I, I moved to South Africa to help run the wrestling office in 94, uh, about six months before Mandela was elected. So, I mean, I got to watch that whole country shift from apartheid to a black-run government. So, it was, it was really kind of neat to be that part of history. You know, I was out there when the movie um, Invictus was, came out. You know, I was out there and was a part of all of that. You know, with 
you know, I was going to the to the games and stuff, but I was also doing security work when I wasn't doing wrestling. So I stayed pretty busy and stuff during those times. But it was it was just a very unique and interesting time, and I'm I'm really glad that I was you know a part of it and got to experience it. And you know, between the wrestling and the wrestling, kind of led to me bodyguarding a lot in South Africa when I wasn't wrestling. So I got to meet a lot of neat people and a lot of uh, entertainers that came through, like Tina Turner and Elton John and all those people. I, I bodyguarded for a little while for Nelson Mandela's granddaughter, so I got to meet, you know, President Mandela. And, you know, that was just a really neat experience. I'd say, I mean, that's something that, that's something that's in, it's in the history books, you know, right. that, that's something that, that people only read about, and you were actually, you were actually a part of it. Um, the... Going back to Mexico there for for a minute, I read that you were uh, you were the only, I think it was just a specific uh, specific promotion, but you were the only American that went there and wasn't a bad guy. No, that was Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was notorious for bringing in Americans as a good guy, and then within two weeks, two months, they flip them over to a bad guy because they wanted everything to be focused on the locals as, as yeah. the good guys and you know all of us big mean Americans that are coming in, we're, we were the bad guys. But they never did that with me. As I stayed as the, you know, as a baby face for the, for the two years that I was there, and they never turned me. Did they ever, did they ever try to flip you, or was no, it something that they No, they never even asked me to. So, I mean, I was, I was over pretty strong with the fans. And, um, you know, it was just uh, a situation to where they just decided to leave me alone. I was just kind of the guy that, I would tag with all the big guys and I'd get involved with angles and stuff, you know, like with Abdullah the Butcher and Barbarian and guys like that. But for the most part, they kept me as a baby face the whole time. Now they tried to bring me back a couple of years later and turn me, but I wasn't there but about a month, so it didn't really. Didn't really come to fruition. Yeah, we really didn't get to where we were trying to go on the end game. I mean, Puerto Rico was kind of, they were kind of notorious and stuff for kind of screwing the guys and stuff on paydays. You know, we were okay. expecting one thing, and we'd get maybe half of what we were expecting to get, and, you know, all sorts of different things went on with that, and it just, it was just better for me to leave at that point in time, because I had a pretty steady thing in Mexico, so, I mean, I could, and that was part of the reason why I left, as well as they, wa they wanted me to stop working in Mexico, but I was making so much money down there, it was stupid for me to do. Mm -hmm. So, I went back to Texas, and, you know, worked down in Mexico City for for 15 days and I'd have four weeks off. But during those four weeks, they would keep me booked in the northern part of Mexico, like Tijuana and Monterey and you know Chihuahua, Durango, all those places. So I stayed really busy until I moved to South Africa, you know, in Mexico. And uh, and I, you you worked you worked with another big guy, Andre the Giant. Was that the biggest guy you worked with? Or? That was, you know, I've never seen anybody with those kind of features. Now Andre was really. Was it seven foot tall, really? Though was it? Uh, he was my size. You know, okay. we were both right there at that seven foot. You know, he could have been seven one, maybe. Yeah, but I he think was, by I no think means was he seven four, seven yeah, five. Yeah, they, they that was that was a total work, guys. I'm sorry to break your hearts. <laughs> Andre wasn't that. Tall, hey, I right? was seven two, seven three in a lot of the places that I went. So yeah. okay, <laughs> I understood because once you've got us up in the ring, you never know. People can't tell three or four inches. You know, if you're six six and they say you're six nine or six ten, it's hard for them to tell because they're looking up, which makes you look bigger. Yeah. You know, and then with me, you know, kind of like Andre, so if I always stepped over the top rope when I got in the ring. Well, of course, that just created an instant awe because I was the only one doing that. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it was, it was it was great wrestling, Andre. I wish if I could have my my way with everything, I would have loved to wrestle Andre. 10 years into my career and 10 years back in his. Because by the time I got to wrestle Andre and stuff, his, his back and hips and everything were so bad. You know, he could, he could barely get around. You know, when he, um, when he dropped an elbow on me and stuff, I mean, he held onto the top rope till he was about six inches off of my chest before he dropped it. Hmm. You know, because he just couldn't get down like that anymore. And you, you wrestled him in Japan? I wrestled right? him in Japan. Probably the tallest tag team match in probably in the history of wrestling, because my partner was six ten. Andre and I are both seven footers, and then Giant Baba was about six ten. So I mean, all together you had about twenty eight feet of wrestler in, in that ring. 
Hmm. So, uh, you know, I've had a couple of people tell me that was the tallest match in Japan. I'm sure it's probably the tallest match anywhere. So it was just, it was just two on two? Two, two on two. On two. I, I, you know, I would say that you would, it would be hard to find that anywhere else. Right. Without, without adding, without adding three, without going uh, three deep or something. On right. Side. But I, I would, I don't know that I've ever seen four guys almost seven, seven foot right around that, right around that stature go at it. I don't think. Not I've that I've that. ever seen. I mean, I know that they, you know, WWE had Kane and Big Show together, which was a big tag team. But I mean, they didn't really have anybody that big to work against them. Yeah. They're, they're actually still. They're actually still working as a tag team on house shows. Oh, are they doing tags again? Yeah, I didn't uh, realize that. They're they're, uh, they're both off TV right now, but at the house shows, and we got one coming up in Pikeville next month, and I, they're both slated. So I bet they're going to be as okay. a tag team. But I don't, you know, I don't know if they're. I, I'd imagine they don't have a seven foot tag team on each side, <laughs> to, on the other side to go against them. Uh, but yeah, the only big tag, t you think Kane and Big Show and Kane and Undertaker, those are the only. Right, and Undertaker's really? only six nine, mm -hmm. you know, but they book him at seven foot. Kane's only six ten. Now Big Show's seven foot, but I mean, it's they've they've always exaggerated how big we were. You know, a lot of times I went into places at seven two and four hundred pounds. You know, instead of being seven foot and three seventy, you know, but it sounds better to the average person that's never seen anybody like me. Well, let's boost the inches a couple of bit and the pounds a little bit, and they're never going to know the difference. Well, it's all the spectacle of wrestling and and, and what it is. Smoke uh, and mirrors. We uh, we we talked about doing uh, we talked about doing a live sh live wrestling show here once, and we were I was talking to our play by play guy, and he's like, I wouldn't even know what to do. And I said, Well, the thing about wrestling, because he's he does basketball and football, I said, if you want to just say, Hey, I just saw this guy bench five hundred pounds in the back. You can say that, you know, right. you, you know, you make, but you make people believe it to get, to get an, a specific reaction out of certain people. And it, and it's really, it's really an art form. It's, it's well, it is. I mean, it's changed a lot. You know, I started wrestling. My first match was in 87. So that was before Vince had come out and told everybody that it was just entertainment, that it wasn't a sporting thing. And, you know, the way things were done then versus the way things are done now are completely different. Mm -hmm. You know, all we would be told and stuff is, you know, you need to do 20 minutes tonight. And this is how the match is going to end, and that was what we would do. WWE pretty well scripts everything from the time they leave the curtain until the time they come back to the curtain. And they all follow a big script. We didn't do that. We ad-libbed everything. Yeah, and, and I think it, it keeps getting more and more at the WWE, you know, at the WWE. And that's what everyone thinks of when they think of wrestling. That's what... Uh, it's getting more and more scripted. Uh, I know in the, uh, in the late 90s when I was when I was growing up, uh, I hear these guys, you know, the Steve Austins and the, the Rocks, and they said, "Look, when we went out, we had, we 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 had scripted segments, but we kind of, you know, they had some creative creative." They had a little there. wiggle room for creativity. And yeah. but w for the matches, they said, "Okay, we've got, you know, we've got, come out here, let the baby face get his stuff." We'll do a we'll do a heat spot, a comeback, and then we've got the finish. And they know all that stuff. But it seems now it's everything. Oh yeah, it's from the time they leave the curtain it's until they all get back. choreographed. And I mean for for us it would be this is how we want the match to start. If they had something special we needed to do in the match for something in the future, we would do that in the middle. And then we knew how the match was going to end. Everything in between was us. And it was to me it was better because the the fan, you never knew what kind of fan you were going to get from one area to the other or from one town to the next. You know, sometimes they wanted to watch a wrestling show. So mm -hmm. we'd have to get up there and trade holds and, you know, just do the wrestling holds. And then you would go out the next night planning to do what we did last night. And these people are wanting blood and guts and want, you know, they want brawling and, you know, everybody's being, <laughs> you know, punching and kicking all night. So what we originally planned on doing we would have to change in midstream while we were in the ring. Which a lot of, you know, it's, I laughed at a kid one night uh, doing an independent show that had just come out of WWE and he had pretty well spent most of his time in their territory, you know, in their developmental programs and everything else. And, you know, he came and asked me, he said, you know, well, what, what do you want to do tonight? I said, oh, don't worry about it, we'll do it in the ring. <laughs> like deer in the headlights, so, you know, he'd, he'd never heard that before. Because he'd always been given a script of this is what you're going to, this is what everything's going to happen in the match. 
So it's, it's a different creature now than what, you know, when Vince expanded everything, I mean, it changed the whole wrestling world. I mean, it killed all the territories and, you know, he, he bought up all the big talent and stuff from the territories, which is why they died. And, you know, it's, you know, now it's pretty well just him. You know, it's whatever he wants, to, whatever direction he wants to take the world of professional wrestling in the United States pretty well relies on Vince. And now, and now they're also a, a public entity. They used to be, used to, right. used to be a, you know, just the Vince McMahon, <laughs> the Vince McMahon brain, which he's still the brainchild behind it. But now he's got, now he's got corporate sponsors. Right. You know, they have to, they have to, they can't probably with the people that are investing in it now, they'll never be able to go to uh, TV 14. They have to stay PG. You know, they so. stay PG because of the sponsors and because of the big uh, younger crowd following but they've been away so far from the Attitude Era and stuff when you saw a lot of blood and things like that. There are those fans that that's what they want to see. You know, and they're, they're losing those fans because they don't do it. But, you know, they've got the corporate money, so that, that's really all that they care about at this point. Do you think the days of ever making money in wrestling outside of WWE, do you think those are past? Do you think they're going to come back maybe? Uh, or? Because there's still those fans that really want... Uh, you know, that really want the, just the quality wrestling and they want the, the edgier stuff. We air uh, on, here on WYMT on Saturday nights, we air Ring of Honor and that's a real, okay. that's a real, you know, just a real technical wrestling show. Right. A lot, a lot of, a lot of stuff that is, that is popular with the, with the smart crowd, you know, the. Right, because the they appreciate the athleticism a lot of those guys do. You know, when, when I first started, so they, they really wanted to watch what they considered a fight or a wrestling match. You know, and now it's up because they do so much high flying stuff and all the flips and flops and everything else stuff and the people that are watching things like Ring of Honor and stuff, they appreciate the athleticism they're seeing, but they're not really following it and stuff to watch, you know, what's the next wrestling match gonna be. Yeah, I don't know if you've uh, I don't know how much you keep up with the product today, but last not much. <laughs> not much, not much. La is last week or the week before last, social media blew up because this one match between these two guys over in uh, over in Japan is uh, Osprey and Ricochet. If you not know, you can look them up. But basically, they are. I mean, it was maybe the the biggest, the best athletic spectacle I've ever seen with the things they were doing. But uh, Vader, <laughs> Vader came to uh, uh, criticize it because he said it looked like a choreographed dance routine. You know, mm -hmm. and, and that, that's what he said. Mm, that's kind of how way some of us older guys see and that, it. That's, too. that's the way. He, but the problem, the problems he had was it is it didn't look like, you know, they 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 want to do these move, flips off the the ropes and jumping off just just wild stuff. Right. But it looks like they're almost setting themselves up for it, and it doesn't look like the the payoff the the. It's, it doesn't tell the story that some of these old matches do. Right, and, and, you've and got that's so the many big people. thing too, because yeah. for us it was all about psychology. We wanted to do things that were believable that the fans could relate to. So if I got your arm and I'm twisting it or bending it in a certain direction, at some point in time it's that a lot of those fans had gone through the same thing, so they understood how that felt. You know, your average fan has no idea what it feels like to be laying in the ring and somebody do a triple flip off of the top and land on you. It's not reality. You know, and I mean, it's the smarter people are like, well, why didn't he move? It took him two minutes to get up to the top rope. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I mean, that's where a lot of the older guys have a problem with today's, uh, you know, with today's product is that there's so much involved with all the acrobatic stuff and everything that we would have never done. Yeah, uh, I, I remember hearing uh, Big Show when he was the Giant. Right. Uh, Hogan, he he used to do like a, a drop kick off the top rope or something. <laughs> you know? Oh wow! And uh, and Hogan just told him, "You don't do that. You're a Giant. You don't do that stuff." You know. You I know? got the same speech. <laughs> you know, when when I was growing up, so one of my big idols to watch that I kind of patterned a little bit of my stuff with was Bruiser Brody. And I don't know how many, you know, Brody matches and stuff you've ever watched. He a handful, a handful, yeah. You know, Brody would throw a drop kick. And I mean, he was 6'6", 320. But I always thought that was the most impressive thing in the world to see a guy that size get up and throw a drop kick. 
So, you know, I worked on that when I first started training and everything, and I threw a pretty good drop kick. My first night in Puerto Rico and I threw a drop kick, the office pulls me back and is like, don't ever do that again. We don't want you doing drop kicks or things where you're up in the air so that you stay on the ground. And that pretty well ended, you know, things that I thought I was good at doing, you know, because I would do the drop kicks, I'd do the flying elbows and things like that, and they grounded me the first night. Hmm. And, you know, I worked over there for a couple of years, so then I just kind of got out of the habit of doing those things. Yeah, but I mean, I could do a lot more when I first started, but the offices never thought that big guys should leave their feet. Everybody, everybody kind of patterned the big guy against Andre of the 70s or the 80s. They all expected us to work the same way. And to, you know, even when Andre first started, I think he did drop kicks. Hmm. You know, back in never the seen that, early <laughs> mid-70s and stuff, I think Andre even did drop kicks. But... You know, once he pretty well got to where giants don't leave their feet and giants don't, are very methodical about everything and stuff, then it, the, that kind of carried over to the rest of the big guys that came after Andre and it's like, well, you need to be like Andre. And Big Show got that a lot because he had the same kind of build as Andre did. So yeah, it's, they'll, they'll pull you together and stuff. And it's like, big guys are supposed to be big, little guys are supposed to do all the high flying stuff. I mean, Bam Bam Bigelow was a was a great example of a yeah. big guy. I mean, he could drop moons, kick, cartwheel, moonsault, moon you know. And I mean, Scott was 300 pounds. You know, and he could do all that stuff. But you know, for the most part, stuff they it, it's really been separated between the big guy and the little guy. Yep, and I think you know you've got you know the, the psychological matches, you've got the the high flying matches, you've got the hardcore matches. I, I, I hope one of these days that uh, that there'll be a couple other you know promotions pop up so that everybody can get a little bit of of what they want. Right. But, uh, but as for right now, it looks like every, everything is going to everything goes through WWE. So they they have the they have kind of no hardcore stuff, but it's uh, well, that's where the money is. It's it's, it's all ath it's all ath it's, it's all athletes uh, just doing doing athletic things. So. Well, I mean, I know when they first started the, I guess the first Hell in the Cell match, I think was Undertaker and Shawn Michaels. And I mean, when you knew they were doing a Hell in the Cell match, you knew there was going to be a lot of blood during that match. Yeah. And, you know, growing up in the, the early part of wrestling, if you got your head thrown into a steel post, you or, bled. You, or you got it raked across a fence or across barbed wire or something like that, it didn't make any sense not to bleed. That made perfect sense. They did. They used something to make you bleed. And now they have those kind of matches and it's, there's not any kind of blood or anything else. And it just kind of, to me, it takes away from that type of a match. Yeah, they actually had a, a pay-per-view a, a, a little bit ago called Extreme Rules. Right. And, when, and every match is a gimmick match like that. And there wasn't a drop of blood. But they can't, but they can't, they don't do that stuff anymore. So uh, it, it's almost to the point that you know, wh why, if, if you're going to use the gimmick, you know, right. uh, you know, make the most of it. Don't, with the, they had a Hell in a Cell match at, uh, at WrestleMania and you, you know, we had a guy jump off the cage and land on, you know, so that, that's using the gimmick. I, I get that, but I, I totally, I'm totally with you. It's, if you're not going to, if you're, if you're going to have it there and it's just a prop and it doesn't, doesn't serve a purpose, right. then, then you've, and you've wasted your time with it. You could have told a better story without right. it. You know, I really don't follow much of today's product. I retired about three years ago because I had to have my neck fused from my C4 to T1. Uh, I've also got my lower back is fused from L3, 4, and 5, and I have an artificial knee. <laughs> so it, with my neck, the doctors told me and stuff, if I landed wrong, somebody hit me wrong, anything like that, I could be paralyzed. And when I was told that, then I decided, you know, it, it's time to hang it up. It's time to hang it up because I, I really don't want to spend the rest of my life in a wheelchair. Yeah, you know, and then a little bit later, you know, I was I still get phone calls from promoters wanting me to come do shows, even now. But you know, I kind of came to the conclusion that it's a lot better for me to run my mouth for a living than to get hit in the head with a chair every night. So I don't hurt near as much the next morning as what I used to when I was wrestling. <laughs> As long as you don't run it to the wrong person. Right. As long as you don't run it to the wrong person. But wrong I've, enjoy, I've enjoyed switching over. So, you know, I use 
stories that I've learned from the road and guys that I've known and and everything else and stuff and a lot of the stuff that I speak about and stuff I, I wind those stories and stuff into the the points that I'm trying to get across. Do you find the 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 stories and the, the talking do you find that just as rewarding as wrestling really? Um, in yeah, way, in, in, in some in some ways, you know, it's um, it's really fulfilling when you get a kid after you've talked to a school come up to you and tell you and stuff how much it meant to, for them to hear me or I'm going through these problems at home and you just said something that can help me get through them. So that or you know, they'll come up afterwards. And it's like I've got this, this and this going on. So what can I do? And I just love helping people. It doesn't matter to me whether it's a kid or an adult. You know, kids are more special and you know, I, w I spent 25 years and stuff in wrestling. 20 of it was spent as a heel. You know, so I was the bad guy everywhere I went. So with that persona, especially in foreign countries, because WWE was fake, but the local wrestling was real. So you can ask any of the fans in foreign countries. They'll swear that their wrestling is, is real and the American stuff is the choreographed fake stuff. You know, so I mean, being able to do that but being the bad guy, I wasn't able to sign a lot of autographs. I wasn't able to talk to a lot of kids because it just wasn't expected of my character. And, you know, I hated that because that goes against my natural personality. So this is kind of my way of giving back to all the, the kids, the fans, everything that I was kind of rude to and didn't sign autographs when I wanted to. This is kind of my way of giving back now so from being able to give talks and messages that will help people in their life. Is this your first time in Eastern Kentucky, Tops? Uh, talking, yes. You know, I work for uh, for Mid South. Mid South, yeah. There in Memphis, so I mean, I, I did come into the Louisvilles and Lexingtons and uh, Evansville, Indiana, and you know, places like that were on our regular schedule. So I mean, I did get to come into those areas to wrestle, but this is the first time I've come in and spoke. Well, uh, I mean, it was it was great having you on the show here. Uh, oh, I've enjoyed it. This has been fun. Oh, absolutely! And if you're uh, if you ever come back, stop by again because this definitely is, so. This is good. Maybe maybe I'll uh, <laughs> find some more stuff to talk about. But always, <laughs> always good to talk wrestling with someone, and uh, and we appreciate sure. what you're I doing. I appreciate here. it. Thanks for having me. And uh, we'll see you guys next week.